Like they didn't suggest dial-up modems were the solution. Right. They just dictated, they'd indicated that was the problem. So the issue here was is that early cable modems as well as early satellite dishes um, and even later satellite dishes, they fixed this with cable modems before they did satellite dishes, could not send the request out. They could receive data down. Their download worked, but they had no upload. Does that make sense? Even before the internet, in the early days of uh, pay-per-view TV with cable companies, um, well, in the really, really early days, you had to call to talk to a person. <laughs> I remember um, uh, ordering uh, WrestleMania 1. <laughs> I, I watched that live. <laughs> Do they still have WrestleManias? No lefties, no wrestling fans. WrestleMania one, that was uh, Hulk Hogan body slammed Andre the Giant. That's going to be on a quiz at some point. <laughs> yeah. So in any case, uh, in the really early days, you had to phone up the cable company to order pay-per-view. But then after they started making their, your cable boxes somewhat smart, you could go find the movie you wanted and you had to select it. Well, your cable box would have a phone line coming into the back of it. That phone line was used for sending requests out for something. For instance, requesting uh, to rent a movie, request pay-per-view, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then you would download the movie through the cable service. Same thing for like Dish Network and DirecTV. Um, so cable modems did not have the ability to send information up. They couldn't make a request. So if you typed in www.google.com and press enter, your cable modem alone could not make that request. Your dial-up modem could make that request, then download the request through the cable modem. So your download would be fast, but the upload would be slow. Not a big deal because most of our uploads, most of our requests are tiny little pieces of information. Get me www.google.com. You know, I'd like to start downloading this file. Once you start downloading the file, now it's now it's a, a larger piece of data. That you could use the cable modem for. So the fix for this in the early in the early days was you would have your cable modem as well as a dial-up modem. So you were paying two different charges. Sometimes the cable companies would run their own internet service providers for dial-up, but at the very least you were paying for a second phone line for the internet, because um, in the early days of dial-up, I mean, you, if you were on the internet, you're, you couldn't receive phone calls at your house, uh, or if somebody picked up the phone, you'd get disconnected from the internet. Um, so people who were on the internet a lot would pay for two telephone lines. A telephone line was probably 40 bucks a month, something like that. So you already had that cost. Then you had the cost of the internet service provider that was not your cable provider. Then you had the cost for your cable modem. So in the early days of these things, cable modems were not really considered good. You know, DSL was some substantially better technology because they could send and receive from one device. And on top of that, uh, DSL didn't make you have to have more than one phone line. One phone line could handle both voice and data. We talked about that last time. We had that filter. We talked about you plug this filter in and it's split between the voice line and the data line. Data frequencies on the uh, DSL. Okay. So, that was a problem with uh, um, early cable modems. Now, last time we talked about DSL, uh, we mentioned something called the final mile. What was that? It's like when you're far away from uh, the DSLAN thing. Because that's, you know, closer you are in proximity, the faster, well, yeah, the faster your connection is. Potentially, yeah. Is, yeah. yeah. The closer you are to the DSLAM, um, the faster your potential connection is. And you get too far from the DSLAM, that is, in the early days, farther than a mile away from it, all of a sudden. And that's a mile as the copper runs, not physically. And that actually caused some interesting problems in these really old telephone networks. The uh, What's the old telephone network called? Four letters? 
POTS, plain old telephone service. Um, that would be a good quiz one of these days, too. Uh, in any case, uh, this, these networks are so old, and a lot of times we are dealing with problems that were solved 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago. In some cases, I guess, even longer than that. We don't necessarily know why they maybe wrapped copper 4,000 times around something to accomplish a certain task. So you might have a situation where you have the D-slam here, you're 20 feet from it, and you can't get DSL. Because even though you're physically 20 feet from the D-slam, you might have 12 miles of copper underneath you for whatever reason. Okay, so you're kind of at the mercy of that type of thing. It's not that the cable networks are uh, uh, necessarily without those uh, weird problems like that. Uh, they don't really suffer from final mile type issues, but the cable network in general is a much newer network than the telephone network. So less completely stupid stuff, I guess you might say. And it's entirely possible some of these decisions that they made on the, uh, the POTS network years ago didn't seem stupid at the time. But when we look back and when they, we wonder what they were thinking, it becomes problematic. So in any case, that final mile is as the copper goes, not physical distance. It's the distance of the wire. More modernly, it's more like the final three miles. And now they have remotely connected D-slams, so they just link a bunch of D-slams together. So now you can pretty much get DSL in most, you know, most, non, most areas that aren't like out in the middle of the wilderness. So let's say, and actually my brother lives in the wilderness and he can get DSL. So there's phone supplier, you know, phone company put in the equipment for it. Um, okay, so with cable, uh, well, actually, let's go back here to DSL. Remind me, did I talk about the way they sell bandwidth on DSL? Kind of like hotels or airline tickets? Yeah. Okay, so even though DSL is considered to be a dedicated circuit, where you've bought your 1.5 megabit per second, that's only if the bandwidth is available. So they hope you don't complain. That tends to be one argument people make to when they're comparing DSL to cable. Well, cable is shared, DSL is dedicated, and that that's true. But under behind the scenes, they're still selling the uh, more bandwidth than they have. All right, so cable networks again, are shared networks. That is, um, for example, I have uh, um, a 100 megabit per second cable modem at my house. So I pay for, I pay Time Warner for wherever their maximum service speed is. And about three months ago, they bumped it from 50 megabits to 100 megabits. Now, does that mean I can get 100 megabits all the time? Well, we're back to the old argument. It depends who I'm downloading from, right? Okay. Does Time Warner Cable probably have more than 100 megabits total in bandwidth? Sure. Yeah, they probably have more than 100 megabits total in bandwidth. Now, do you think that they have enough bandwidth that they own for, the, for every single person who's on the, the Time Warner's cable network here in uh, the Milwaukee area for all of them to download at full speed? No, no way. Not even close. So again, they're hoping that we don't maximize the connection and have service problems. We don't complain. So anymore, our internet connections keep getting faster and faster and faster, but they are less about um, maximum download speed on a single application, but more about being able to perform multiple internet type uh, uh, services. So maybe you're streaming Netflix in two different rooms, you're playing a video game, you're downloading a file, split that across 100 megabits, you're doing everything at pretty high performance. Makes sense? And you have some bandwidth to spare. Now, given that argument, let's say max speed of DSL is, let's just say, 12 megabits per second. Max speed of cable is, let's just say, 100 megabits per second. Google's actually currently working with some fiber optic stuff that can do a gigabit per second, but that's not going to be in everybody's backyard anytime soon. Okay, so we're going to we're going to compare these two. So now we're the normal average Joe consumer, and we're being offered DSL, we're being offered cable, 
At the same price point, these are both their maximum speeds. Just at a glance, which of these looks better to you? Cable. 100 is a lot bigger than 12. Why would anybody ever get DSL? What's the driving? What's, I mean, DSL exists, right? People get DSL. Why? Okay, but that's not really the case. Possibly up upload speeds. So if we extend this a little bit, so this is 12 megabits down by maybe 3 megabit per second up. It's kind of your max there on DSL in terms of what they're offering consumers. Um, I think my 100 megabits, this is down by, um, I want to say I have 20 megabit per second up on that circuit. It might be 15. But even uploads faster on cable. DSL Potentially. Okay, so one thing you might see is DSL tries to undercut cable in terms of price. All right, another thing is you have the perception of dedicated versus shared. Um, when somebody's selling you DSL, they're probably going to use that kind of language. Well, with your cable modem, you're sharing your internet. So if everybody in your neighborhood is on uh, uh, the internet at the same time, your connection is going to slow way down. And in the early days of cable modems, that was true. That was a real problem because bandwidth wasn't as prevalent as it is today. So if you were like in a you know Chicago area where you had a lot of population density, the way cable modems work is they create this cluster. So around, like, I live in Grafton. So within Grafton, my guess is there's probably six to eight different cable clusters in the city. And each of those clusters is dedicated an amount of bandwidth among time order cables, total bandwidth they've dedicated to the Grafton area. I'm sure in some network map, Grafton is considered to be a, a subcluster or something like that. Okay? So my neighborhood gets X amount of bandwidth. And I'm in cluster one, let's say. Another neighborhood gets, let's say, the same amount of bandwidth. They're in cluster two. So that means in my neighborhood, we're all sharing the amount of bandwidth that was allocated to us. Historically, like maybe in Chicago, we have a lot of population density in the early days of modems where it was really expensive for them to have this, uh, this bandwidth. They would run out of bandwidth. And if enough people in your neighborhood were getting on the internet, you'd run out of You'd run out of bandwidth, and your connection would seem very, very, very slow. Um, that was kind of the growing pains of the internet, because you had this interesting thing where the cable companies weren't going to pay for more bandwidth than they thought they needed. But as the internet became more and more popular among consumers, you had consumers then digesting more and more bandwidth because you had more providers, content providers, putting content out there that required bandwidth. So you had the cable company constantly adding more bandwidth as they, there was a need and they raised their prices and the consumers would start using more bandwidth. We just keep seeing this over and over again, right? Okay. So cable does suffer from this idea of shared bandwidth. But the reality is we don't really recognize it today. At least not in typical internet usage when we think about our internet. Uh, I'll give you an example here in a minute of where we do recognize it. Similarly, on the DSL side, it is a dedicated circuit, but there's no guarantee that they've actually hooked up enough bandwidth to it when you need it for it to fulfill the dedicated circuit. So sure, you're not sharing. You know, your three megabits down is your three megabits down, but you better hope that they have three megabits to spare when you want it. Kind of makes sense? Um, so really, from that perspective, I'm not sure that there's a great argument other than perception for dedicated versus shared. Okay, but certainly that could be an, an, a reason. How many of you in here have DSL at home? Nobody? Zero people have DSL in here? Cable? Dial-up? Satellite? So those of you who didn't raise your hand on cable, what do you have? Giant Wi-Fi. Oh, okay, giant Wi-Fi. Giant Wi-Fi. Okay, which is essentially, uh, yeah, okay. We don't know what the back technology is, but okay. 
So um, what he has is probably something called line of sight or point-to-point -point Wi-Fi. Um, in your window, there's kind of like a little square thing it, that you point. It's on the roof, yeah. Okay. All right, fair enough. So that's a, a reasonable. I mean, he's you're basically just part of a wireless network, yeah. and at the back office where it's the sources, they have something. If it's the phone company, it's they're buying bandwidth from somebody. If it's the cable company, they're buying bandwidth from somebody. But you're hooked into somebody's wireless network. Okay, anybody else have anything else? Because we didn't. Uh, not every hand was represented, so that means several of you have no internet at home. Uh, Uverse would be considered DSL. DSL. Okay. Which actually segues into what we're going to talk about next. Okay. So, so using that as an example, you have DSL and you have it because it came with your Uverse. You bought the package, right? Okay. So, um, you chose Uverse for TV, and it made sense financially to get their internet as well. As opposed to having internet with one place and TV with another place, they give you the package deal, right? Okay, and you like your Uverse internet? Works fine. Yeah. No harm, no foul. Okay, do you know what the speed is you have? Um, no, I didn't okay. All technologists should know what their internet speed is at home. And by the way, I promise you're not the only one in here who doesn't know. Who else does not know what their internet speed is in here? Who's lying? Who doesn't have internet at home? Okay, anybody else with Uverse? Okay, so somebody's not voting. What do you have? Well, I live in an apartment building. That's kind of a general. Okay, you have shared Wi-Fi. Yeah. Okay, so their source is something. Kind of. So I you're know. you're kind of like in his boat where. I have a router. In they have a network cable going out to this apartment. Mm. So whatever okay. they get. Gotcha. So from your perspective, you, you're providing your Wi-Fi for your, your apartment, yeah. but you're getting, you have an Ethernet cable plugged in the wall just like you would if you lived in the dorm here, yeah. and the source of that is whatever, whatever it is. Pro could be cable, could be, probably is a business class cable, would be my guess, at an apartment building. But yeah, fair enough. Um, okay, well, in any, do you know what your speed is? It depends who's on Okay. Uh, I can get up to 60. Okay. So you've well, done, uh, but you know that from a speed test. Yeah, right? I've done, uh, well, I get down to five. Sure. Down. Sure. Yeah. So he's in a situation where the only way he can really tell what his speed is, similar to you maybe, unless they sold you a speed, is you have to run a, a, a speed test on it and maybe take kind of the average of it over, you know, different situations as opposed to knowing what the cable or DSL provider sold you. You know, they sold you a 12 megabit down by 3 megabit up circuit. They sold us 3. 3 meg down by, what, 768 up? I Something can't, like that. can't remember what the But, I mean, 3 megabit down is, is, is fine. That lets you do pretty much everything. Um, I mean, I remember an uh, interesting internet history story, I guess, uh, when... Broadband, well, I guess it wouldn't be broadband anymore, but fast internet, non-dial-up internet first started coming out. I was in Macomb, Illinois, teaching at Western Illinois University, and uh, there was a local provider in town that was offering uh, uh, DSL, and the phone company there was Verizon. So they were offering DSL. We didn't have a cable modem company there. Uh, we had a cable company, but they didn't offer cable modems yet. So they were offering DSL. And the reason they were offering DSL is because Verizon had come in and said that they were not going to offer DSL in the area. So this local, these two local ISPs worked with Verizon to work out a contract so that they could buy the DSL circuits at a certain price. Okay, just like in uh, uh, real life with other products, uh, the more bulk you buy, the lower the price per item, right? That's why Walmart can undercut other people's prices is because... They have 4 million stores all over the place, and they can buy a zillion rolls of toilet paper. So their price per, to per roll of toilet paper is a lot less than, you know, Joe's Home Shop, <laughs> which buys toilet paper, you know, by one pallet at a time or something. He's paying a lot more per roll. Um, so in any case, they made a deal with uh, the local internet service providers to sell them the circuits at a certain rate. 
uh, because Verizon wasn't going to come into the area. So I was buying um, a DSL in the early days. I think I had 256 kilobits per second. And this was SDSL. This was synchronous DSL through one of the cable providers using this like, dedicated equipment between uh, me and them. Um, and that was something like $700 a month uh, for, for that. This was like before phone companies were offering it. So I was like the, the guy in town who didn't want to use dial-up because I was crazy. Um, so like 256 kilobits per second was just ridiculous speed. It's ridiculous speed. Um, so in any case, uh, um, then they started offering actual normal DSL circuits. And I had a 1.5 megabit down by uh, probably 768 up or something like that. Uh, 768 kilobits per second up. And that was through the local ISP, and that was uh, maybe something like $80 a month, a lot less, once they were able to start selling the DSL circuits. Next thing you know, I start getting things in the mail offering three megabits down for $29 a month from Verizon. So this is a little tiny town. Basically, the population of this town is 98% the university. Uh, Macomb, Illinois. So in the summer, the town was dead. There was nothing in this town when there wasn't students on campus. Okay? Big state university. Well, that's why the cable company didn't bring uh, cable modems into town. Because the cable company wasn't providing cable to the, the dorms, to the university. They, the university provided the, their own TV access or whatever. Um, so that it, it wasn't worth it for cable comp the cable company to invest in that stuff. But the phone service did start investing in it. But in any case, I get this mailer from Verizon Online offering DSL for you know twice the speed at a, like a third the price. I think it actually was like a third the price. I must have been paying over a hundred. Um, but whatever, a lot less for a lot more. And it was actually an interesting. You could probably find this somewhere in some legal document. It was an interesting thing. Verizon ended up suing themselves. The issue was is the parent company, Verizon, the Verizon Telephone Company, had entered into an agreement with the local internet service providers. Um, uh, Logonix was one of them, and the other one was uh, Infobon, Infobon in town. And that agreement was, we will sell you DSL circuits at this rate. Why? Because Verizon will not be offering uh, DSL in town. Okay, so... This is what we can sell them to. Because usually DSL circuits were priced based on the number of customers that you sold circuits to. Okay, and for a little town like this, you didn't have that many people on these circuits. There was a population of maybe 7,000 people without the university population. 50,000 people with the university population that were not using DSL. So they were getting a very good deal per circuit given the number of circuits they were, they were purchasing. Well, what happened is sometime between that agreement and when I got this mailer, Verizon spun off their internet service pro provider um, business under its own business entity called Verizon Online, still under the same parent company. Well, Verizon Online now was Verizon's wing of let's go across the world and sell DSL. Well, Verizon Online was not little mom and pop internet service provider in Macomb, Illinois. It was big mom and pop internet service provider across the entire United States. So their number of connected, their number of connected uh, uh, DSL circuits span their entire customer base. So they were able to buy a DSL circuit from the parent company Verizon for a fraction of what the local providers could offer it or what they could buy it for because they were buying it in more bulk. Verizon Online was buying 30 million circuits Local providers were buying 1,500 circuits, <laughs> something like that. Um, and it became this big public thing in town where the uh, Verizon, the local phone company, turned around and sued itself, Verizon Online, which is one of its parent companies. And they had to do this because Verizon had the contract with the local ISPs. Verizon Online didn't fall underneath that contract because it didn't exist at the time the contract was originally sold, or originally signed, rather. So Verizon Online was treated as a brand new company, even though it happened to still be the same parent company. So 
So in the end, it ended up being that Verizon Online could not sell their uh, uh, circuits in town. The local guys won the, uh, um, won the lawsuit. But now think about the, uh, uh, the locals in town now. Fine. Our friends who are internet service providers in town, they won their war. They don't get put out of business by Verizon Online. But wait a minute. I'm a consumer paying for internet. Why should I get half the speed for three times the cost? Maybe these guys need to go out of business and maybe Verizon Online needs to come into town. So now the locals rise up because they're ticked off and now they don't get cheaper internet. So in the end, it ended up being that uh, uh, Verizon sold circuits to the local ISPs as if they were um, Verizon Online at the same price point. Uh, and I think to this day, uh, if you go to Macomb, Illinois, uh, Verizon Online does not, even though Verizon is still the telephone company there, Verizon Online does not offer DSL in town. It's, uh, it was one of those grandfathered in contracts from before the internet was a thing <laughs> that's still in play today. So kind of an interesting, uh, interesting backstory there. Um, but kind of the punchline where I'm going with this is in the early days, DSL was the clear winner. If you had broadband internet, what you would call broadband, you were buying DSL. Okay, very similar to uh, if you were on uh, one of the data plans for, uh, uh, if you were a cell phone, smartphone user, and you were interested in faster data, you would probably go to like a Verizon or a Sprint. Verizon and Sprint used a, um, which is what is now considered an inferior technology, but for a long time, it was the only technology that could do any sort of real speed uh, for uh, uh, cell phones. They used a technology called CDMA. So CDMA-based phones, uh, older Verizon phones, well, still Verizon's network is dual CDMA and G, uh, GSM. Uh, Sprint still uses CDMA. Um, I think those are the two here in the state. Well, uh, US Cellular uses CDMA. Um, so in any case, but then what happened is AT&T, who was always using GSM, passed them all up in speed because they finally figured out how to go fast over GSM. Um, and all these LTE networks we see today, those are all GSM-based. So that's why everybody's jumping on to the LTE bandwagon because we finally figured out how to go fast over GSM where that technology was crap before that. Uh, at some point, we'll probably start talking about cellular stuff, but that's as much as I'll say right now related to that. But in any case, in the early days, DSL was better. Nobody wanted cable for multiple reasons. It wasn't offered in a lot of places. Even where it was offered, it was not cost effective because you had to have a second phone line and you had to have a dial-up internet connection and you really didn't get a greatly increased download speed. It was pretty competitive with DSL. Because back then, the, uh, the roadblock was how much bandwidth did your uh, provider have. Okay, that's what held you back. Now, eventually, they figured out how to send uh, requests through the cable network. So, for instance, if you have cable TV today, um, you don't have to plug a uh, telephone line in the back of it, right? You have the coaxial cable, and you can rent your pay-per-view movies or your on-demand stuff, whatever it is. It just works. Right? Those requests are being sent out. It's that same request technology that allows your cable modems to do the same thing. Okay? Bottom line is the original cable uh, networks being shared were meant for broadcast. Data was being pushed out, not received in. That's how the networks were built. So they had to figure out how do they augment their existing networks to allow for requests to come. Now we actually experience this idea of a shared network today, uh, uh, specifically in uh, uh, the cable, uh, cable world. Uh, anybody know how? The example really is with uh, television. Uh, who in here has had a Time Warner cable or Comcast or, you know, cable TV, high definition cable TV? You ever been on a channel when all of a sudden a message pops up saying, 
Um, are you still there? If you want to continue watching this channel, press OK, something like that. Kind of th it thinks like, like if you've been on the same channel for six hours and you're just vegging. It basically wants to know whether you're awake still. Okay, so some of you have seen that. You know, you just assumed that it was uh, uh, just making sure you were still awake, right? Problem is, is in a lot of, since it's, you have these clusters, your neighborhood bandwidth is not just shared for internet, it's shared for bandwidth. Okay, remember last time I said we want to make a distinction between those. Bandwidth is the amount of data that can travel along that network. Well, what kind of data is your cable company uh, delivering to your television set over their network? Pictures, right? How many pictures per second is a uh, television signal, high definition? 60? 60 frames a second, let's say? Okay, most of them are probably less than that. They're most of them are about 48 uh, for it to be called, um, I guess, high definition. But let's just say, let's, let's say it's 60. Okay, so we have 60 frames a second. Now, those of you who have high definition broadcast television, what's the resolution of that? Yep, 1368 by 768. And this is called 1080i. It's interlaced 1080. Full HD is 1920 by 1080. This is 1080p. Okay? But for our cable stations, broadcast high definition is that resolution. Okay, which is roughly half the resolution of this if you multiply out the pixels. Okay, so this is considered high definition. So, how many pixels is that? Well, that's 1368 by 768, so that's a million pixels. And let's say it's 16-bit color times 16-bit times, we'll say 48. 48 per second. That's the number of bits per second. That's the number of bytes per second. That's the number of kilobytes. That's the number of megabytes. So 96 megabytes every one second to deliver a high definition television station uncompressed uncompressed. Now the reality is is that everything about um, our TV today giving us higher and higher definition definition with more and more channels is about compression. Do you ever wonder why you have to have that box for the cable company that plugs why does the coaxial cable from the company go into the box and the box plugs into your TV? Why do you need that box? Why can't you just plug it right into your TV? It's just for show. So I'm going to put their little brand name on it. The box is a computer. What does it do? Decompresses video. So that video is coming in all squunched up, okay, to a much smaller package than 96 megabytes per second. Maybe it's 12 megabytes per second. But then what it has to do is it has to unzip it, decompress it, back to its original format so they could display it on your TV. And it has to be able to keep up. So that box, that's why the box gets warm. It's constantly decoding a compressed video signal, decompressing it and sending it in raw format to your TV. That's what the box does. Make sense? So the cable company keeps working on better and better ways of compressing that data. Same thing's true when we send files over the internet. If you're downloading a gigantic file over the internet, don't you prefer to download it in a compressed format? Same amount of data in a smaller package. And then what happens when it gets to your computer, you use a program like WinZip or something like that to decompress it. Or if it's a RAR file, you unrar it. Make sense? Okay, so compression is about taking out the white space so that we can mathematically reconstruct the data on the, on the back end.
So a lot of what's improved in our cable providers over the years deals with compression. A lot of the reason why things like Netflix and uh, other video streaming services can be successful is because of compression. You know, if you were sending uncompressed video in high definition, well, pseudo high definition, this 1368 by 768, if you were sending that every hour of video, well, so that's, that is one second of video, right? So times 60 is, did I do that right? So that's megabytes per second. So 96 megabytes per second. Let's just, so we have 96 megabytes per second times 60. That's the amount of megabytes per minute. That's over, a, that's over five gigabytes times 90, that's an hour and a half movie. Let's say your typical movie on Netflix. That's megabytes, so divided by 1,024, that's gigabytes. Uncompressed, a not even full high definition movie, a have Z high definition movie, uncompressed is 506 gigabytes for an hour and a half movie. How many of you have ever streamed Netflix over your cellular data plan? A lot of us, right? Okay, now they want you to move over these family share plans and stuff like that, right? Right now, AT&T has some deal where you pay for 15 giga gigabytes a month and you get 30 for the price of 15, something like that. Well, if it's not compressing, I can't watch one movie. I've run out of data. So we rely on that to be heavily, heavily compressed. I'm not sure exactly what their compression rate is, but I would guess that that movie, instead of being 506 gigabytes, is probably significantly less than one gigabyte. Would be my, my guess in the amount of data it's actually sending. Let's call it one gigabyte. I don't think that's a horrible, horrible guess. And it's because whatever machine you're using to receive it is doing the decompressing. So if it's an Apple TV, that guy's doing decompression. If it's an Xbox, he's doing decompression. That kind of stuff. Make sense? Okay, so where we see that shared network problem with cable is when you have that message pop up on your, your screen that says, uh, are you still watching this? What they're really saying is, if you're not watching this, we want to free up some of our bandwidth in case somebody else wants a high definition channel. And let me throw the, the curveball from the other side. Have you ever tried to uh, go to a high definition channel and have it tell you that this channel's not available right now? That's the opposite side of the coin. All the high definition streams in your cluster are currently being taken up. So when you do that, what it's going to do is it's going to try to intelligently figure out which channels are not really being currently watched. Does that make sense? That's what's happening. Now, what's happened over the years, this is probably something that's less common today. What's happened over the years is as your cable companies have been able to expand the amount of bandwidth that they have, and as they've been able to increase their kind of com their compression, um, they're able to offer more than they used to in terms of simultaneous um, high definition streams. Cable though is shared. So what they do is they broadcast those high definition channels and if there's one high definition channel and there's 300 people in the same neighborhood who are all watching that channel, cable's the perfect uh, solution for that. For instance, you might guess that the Super Bowl is pretty uh, tough for that many people to digest that data at once. Cable's the perfect distribution method uh, the way cable networks work is the perfect distribution method for that kind of data because you they're pushing it out once and then all of your cable boxes are just copying it, retrieving it from the pipe. Okay, cable works a lot like Ethernet. When we talk about Ethernet networks, cable works a lot like that. DSL, or um, you know, uh, let's go uh, um, internet TV like Uverse does not. Okay. Uverse is pulling. Uh, when you have your Uverse installed, it's a, it's it's internet TV. It's it's the television is being delivered over a DSL circuit. When you have that installed, what they do is they say, 
here's how many simultaneous high definition channels you can have. And for you know, they let you have usually four channels at once. Out of those four, uh, there's a number of them that might be high definition, depending on the quality of your signal. So some people are lucky enough to be able to do four simultaneous high definition. Other people, it's three high definition, one standard definition at a time. That's what mine is. Uh, some people can only get two and two. You know, it really just depends on what the uh, um, uh, what your connection can sustain. Okay, um, but that's a dedicated stream. So when you are streaming the Super Bowl, they have a single source on you versus network of the Super Bowl. So they're getting it once. And then what they're doing is they're redistributed on a circuit by circuit basis to each TV that's, that's uh, trying to digest it, rather than the TVs grabbing it from a central pipe. Okay, so it's a push technology rather than a pull technology. Kind of an interesting way of looking at the difference. Uh, from our perspective, we don't care, right? I mean, as long as we can watch the Super Bowl. If we watch the movie, we want to watch. We don't care how it's getting to us as long as it works. Um, so with cable, there is not a limit to how many TVs, how many different channels you could be watching simultaneously in your house. You can watch one channel per box you have. They're going to keep charging you a monthly rental fee for each box you want, but there's not a limit. If you want to put 500 boxes in your house, well, they're going to run a lot of coax coaxial cable to your house, but you can watch 500 simultaneous channels um, if you really wanted to. It, doesn't, it won't hurt the cable network at all. Those channels are already being broadcast whether you're watching them or not. Uverse, you're limited to four, period. Um, well, I suppose you are limited to, to four per DSL circuit they run to your house. So in an act of desperation, if you needed more than four, um, you could have them run a second circuit. Um, even if it's uh, you have four different channels or the same ones? Different channels. Four different channels. So you maybe have seen this before. If you're ever in a bar or something like that, and they change the channel on one TV, you know, these bars that have like 15 or 20 or 30 TVs throughout the place, they change it on one TV and it changes on another eight. Because they're probably only able to show three or four different stations simultaneously. Because they have eight of those TVs hooked up to a single box. So it's four unique channels is, is how Uverse works. Um, okay, questions about that. Now, maybe the punchline with what we just talked about deals with, again, moving away from, almost abstracting this idea of what is the internet and what is other network services. Okay? The internet is just like watching TV. It is data that we are bringing into our home and digesting in some way. All right, when we watch Netflix, when we watch cable, we're watching it. That's how we're digesting it. If we are um, browsing the web, our web browser is loading up pictures and text and we're reading it, right? If we're listening to Pandora, it's downloading audio and we're listening to it, okay? So we have a bunch of different ways that we experience network data. But any way you cut it, behind the scenes, it's all traveling the same way. It's coming in over our copper or fiber-based networks, utilizing some sort of technology probably in a compressed format while it's being sent, being decompressed at the end point, being compressed at the starting point. So all these things have to happen in order to move as much data across those networks as possible. And a lot of what we've seen happen over the years in terms of these things evolving has to do with compression. The more we can compress stuff, stuff the more we can fit. Just like packing a suitcase. Squeeze the clothes cl tight enough, <laughs> get all the air out, you can fit more crap in there, right? Um, I just uh, got back from a, a trip, and when I go on these cruise ships, because I'm uh, a little bit gravitationally challenged and the beds are made of stone, um, I bring my own Tempur-Pedic mattress with me. I bring a twin-size Tempur-Pedic mattress. Well, I have to stuff that into a suitcase. Well, so, you know, a mattress is big, right? Well, Tempur-Pedic is like the memory foam. It squishes. 
So you got to compress that all up until it fits in the suitcase, and I just sit on it until I can zip it. <laughs> okay, I can get a pillow in there, and I can usually get some other things. <laughs> you just got to keep compressing. Um, so, you know, it's that type of idea. So I want us in our minds to really abstract away from what we're using the network services for, away from how does data travel across a network. Okay, because we're going to see similarities no matter what the application is. What we think of as internet and what we think of as cable TV, same crap. Data traveling across the pipe to some endpoint, we digest it somehow. Make sense? All right, I'll see everybody on Wednesday.